Our first ever guest on Tommy's Takes is a special one. Locked on Giants' own Patricia Trainer joins the show to talk about her journey, draft talk, and some expectations for the Giants. All coming up on Tommy's Takes. It's time for another episode of Tommy's Takes, covering all things New York Giants. What's up, Giants fans? Thank you for tuning in to another edition of Tommy's Takes. I'm your host, Tommy G. And tonight we have a very, very special show for you. Our guest tonight has covered the New York Giants for over 30 seasons and wears many hats as a Giants beat reporter, journalist, podcaster, producer, author, editor, site manager, and much, much more. But tonight, she's our first guest ever on Tommy's Takes. Patricia, how are you? I'm good, Tommy. Boy, all those those uh, responsibilities have made me exhausted. It's still early. That's a lot of hats. Yeah, it is. All right. So, well, before we get into any Giants talk, I wanted to make sure we talked about you a little bit. Uh, I, you've been very accomplished in your career. You know, you're somebody that's meant a lot to me in my career so far. And I wanted to touch on a little bit. And I know you don't like to talk about yourself, but mm-hmm. you were one of the first ever female beat reporters to cover the New York Giants over 30 years ago. I'm sure the landscape scape has shifted covering professional sports from back then. So just tell me a little bit about your start, some of the obstacles you faced and how it contributed to your current journey. Yeah, well, I mean... Back when I decided I wanted to be a a football writer, there weren't a whole lot of women on the beat. There weren't a whole lot of women in the industry for that matter. So it was very hard to break into. It was like, you know, I remember writing letters to just about every editor, every news outlet saying, hey, you know, I'm majoring in in writing. I I I didn't major in journalism, but I majored in writing. And I was, you know, everybody told me I was pretty good at it. And I wrote for my college newspaper, covered all kinds of sports and I said, I really want to do this. I want to, you know, I know enough about the game to write about it. And of course, you know, the industry at the time was, a, was the boys club. So breaking in was kind of hard, but um, I was fortunate enough to find someone willing to take a chance on me. Um, there was, there's a publication. It still exists to this day because I own it and I actually run it. It's called Inside Football. And back in the day, it was owned by a, a English professor who worked at Pace University, which used to be the training camp home of the New York Giants. Right. His name is Dr. Howard Livingston, who unfortunately is no longer with us. He passed several years ago. And I remember writing him a letter to the editor after finding out about his publication, which was really good. It was different from the type of coverage you read in the newspaper. And I sent him a letter and he was looking for somebody to maybe help him transition into the internet. And I had learned basic HTML and all that stuff. So I wrote him a letter about that. And I said, oh, and by the way, you know, I'd like to learn, you know, I'd like to be a writer for you. If you're, if you're hiring, I think I could do a really good job. So long story short, my father used to work in a law firm in Manhattan and Dr. Livingston came down uh, to meet with me at my father's law firm that where he worked and one corned beef sandwich later, Dr. Livingston and I had struck up a, a working relationship where I would build his, his website and manage his website, which back in the day was kind of rudimentary. And um, he would give me a chance to, to actually learn how to or, or train under him to be a, a journalist, you know, a sports journalist. So I remember, you know, doing that, learning from him, you know, all the advice he gave me. And I took that to, to heart and I've done that for the last 30 plus years. And I've tried to teach that to the new writers that have come through Giants Country and anybody I've really mentored. And here I am. That's awesome. That's an amazing story. You mentioned your father. I know he was a longtime New York Giants season ticket holder, and he played a major role in your love and appreciation for the game and the franchise at an early age. Can you tell us a little bit about the impact he had on you and your choice to cover the Giants? Yeah, my father, you know, my hero. Um, loved that man 
with every ounce of my, of, of my, you know, being my mom too, don't get me wrong, but, but my dad, you know, I, I was a daddy's girl and I'm not ashamed to admit it. <laughs> um, he was a big giant fan, season ticket holder. He used to go up to the Yale bowl. I th- wow. You know, he, he went to um, the old giant stadium, you know, he, he kind of dropped out though for the new giant stadium, the PSL thing didn't go over too well, but I don't blame um, when they transitioned from the Yale bowl to giants, the, the original giant stadium, mm. Wellington Mara had uh, sent out letters to the season ticket holders from the Yale Bowl. And he said, you people will be rewarded. And my father had 50 yard line seats on the visitor side. He had Uh, two seats in row 18 and two seats on the aisle in row 24. So he had a total of four mm -hmm. season ticket hold four season tickets uh, to the old giant stadium. And he and his friend used to go. And then, excuse me, when I got older, my brother and I used to go, we used to take the other two. And it, it was just, you know, it, it was a way to spend, you know, some time with him because obviously he worked during, during the week, he worked in Manhattan and, you know, we saw him at night, don't get me wrong, but, um, you know, obviously we didn't see him as much as we saw my mom who was with us all the time. And, uh, you know, it was, it was an activity that my father and I just, you know, we, we just that came together over and, and we enjoyed it. And, you know, the funny story is my mom on a Sunday always used to like to watch movies and she would watch horror movies and stuff like that. And when I was a kid growing up, I hated that stuff. Now I don't mind horror movies. Yeah. Now I don't mind it. You know, it's like, I'll watch one now, but, but, you know, if given, given my druthers, I'd rather, you know, watch football. And um, I just got into it. And uh, you know, I, I, I said to my father, you know, I, I would ask him questions and he was always patient. He would answer my questions and, You know, I remember one of the few times he took me to the library. My mom always used to take me to the library. I said to him, dad, can you take me to the library? I want to get books on football. And he did. And he helped me pick out books on how to learn the game and and how to understand, you know, the the intricacies of the game. And it was one of the few times he took me to the library because like I said, my mom always took me to the library as a kid, but that time he did. So. Wow. Wow amazing story and you you light up when you speak about your father so that's awesome I, love him. I miss him so dearly he died uh back in uh 2019 september 2019 and you know it's really it's really true what they say when when a loved one dies a piece of you dies with that person and you know i was just i i think i was just finishing up my book or starting my book i can't remember if i no i, I would have been starting it then and i had written one page that I, I had to have done. And, and the page was the dedication page to him. So I, I stuck it in an envelope and I made sure it went into his jacket pocket that he wore in his coffin and he was buried wow. with it. So, and then when my mom passed a, a couple of years later, I gave her an actual copy of the finished book. You could see the, the cover behind me here. And uh, I, I, I remember putting a note in there saying, make sure daddy sees this book. <laughs> so. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing. You know, I know, I know it's not easy sometimes to share the personal stuff, but uh, I'm sure he's super proud of you and where you're at. And I know you've always been proud of him and you always will be. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I, I, I'm happy to do it. I mean, sometimes it's therapeutic to talk about it. So absolutely. All right. Ready to fast forward? Let's do it. So Giants coming off a season where they surprise virtually everyone. Increased expectations are coming up this season. I just wanted to kind of get your thoughts so far in the off season, free agency, unrestricted free agents. You know, what were your thoughts on the off season? Do you think the Giants have closed the gap enough between teams like Dallas and Philadelphia? And where do you think they stand heading into the draft Thursday night? Yeah, I mean, you know, Joe Shane has done very few things right now that I can honestly sit there and say, dude, what are you doing? Um, I kind of like the approach he's taken the last couple of years where, you know, he's he's spent mm-hmm on free agents, you know, multiple year contracts, very sparingly. Otherwise it's been, um, you know, a one year try and buy, if you will. And, you know, that way you can kind of um, determine if, if that guy's going to be a fit or he's a placeholder for maybe, you know, until you can get to the draft and address it in the draft. So I kind of, I think I see what his strategy is and, and, you know, I think he's got him on the right track. Now, as far as have they closed the gap, It's, you know, we obviously still have to get through the draft, but I think they might be a little closer to Dallas. Um, There's still positions that I obviously would love to see them address 
that I think they need to address to really close the gap, cornerback being one of them, you know, with all those speedy wide receivers that exist in the NFC East. Um, but uh, I think, you know, they're, they're, they're making progress. They're headed in the right direction as far as, you know, will they be competitive with the Eagles remains to be seen. You know, let's see what the draft is, because while the Giants are getting better, while Dallas and the, and the Eagles and Washington, for that matter, are also getting better. So you can't just sit here and say, well, the Giants went from, you know, down here to up here while right. everybody stayed down here. No, they, they're all getting better. So. Yeah, I agree. You know, the Eagles talk about them acquiring Derrick Henry now, which uh, just adds another feather in their cap. So definitely still some work to be done for Joe Shane. And that brings me to my next question. The draft is here, right? Thursday night, <clears throat> a couple of different directions the Giants can go into. I think Joe Shane did a really good job filling some spots, most notably inside linebacker, wide receiver, tight end. Still some pressing needs out there. What direction you think the team might go into? Do you think maybe a trade back and then trade up in the later rounds? That's kind of what I've been thinking. But just curious to hear your thoughts on uh, what you think their strategy will will unveil Thursday night. Well, if they keep the 25th overall pick, they'll be the first team since, I think, 2016 when the Steelers kept it. Every team I saw you posted that. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. Every that's, team is kind of traded out of that spot. Um, I think they go defense. I really do. Um, I right now I'm leaning towards cornerback. I think it makes too much sense not to take a cornerback. Um, e- even you know a, a safety. You know, if, if Brian Branch is there, he's so versatile. You know, I could see them maybe going in that direction as well. As I said before, you know, if the Giants want to catch up with the Eagles and and the Cowboys. They better get guys who can cover these receivers because how many times did they get their, their you know, get burnt, mm-hmm. you know? So they, they need some speed in the back end of the defense. They need guys who can play man coverage, who could give Wink Martindale, you know, some additional options to, to pursue and some different wrinkles that he could throw in that maybe he couldn't throw in last year. So I do think it's going to be defense in the first round. Now, if one of those stud cornerbacks, you know, like a Gonzalez or Witherspoon, or a Porter Jr. happens to slide down the board, could we maybe see a trade up? Well, possibly, because I still don't think the Giants are going to take all 10 draft picks. I, I remain convinced somewhere along the line there's going to be a trade. I also would not be surprised if there's a trade back to where maybe the Giants pick up um, some draft picks for next year, because right now, according to over the cap, they are projected not to have any comp picks. And you want to have mm. additional you know, draft picks, should you want to move around the board? And right now the Giants don't have that for 2024. So um, at 25, I think if anything, the Giants may look to trade up depending on if some of those stud cornerbacks slide down the the board, but I could see a case where they potentially trade back as well. Yeah. I'm going to check on Pat. Honestly, you lost Julian Love, right? To Seattle off season, He, you know, for whatever people may have thought of him, he was a starter. He played a ton of snaps for the Giants. You have Adoree Jackson, who the team doesn't seem to really want to rework his deal. Not sure what that means for him after this season. Uh, I've been a big fan of Deontay Banks, cornerback out of Maryland. I would love if he fell. You know, if I was Joe Shane, I'd run that draft card up there. Uh, But I'm with you. You know what? You're in a division where you have Devonta Smith, A.J. Brown, Terry McLaurin. I mean, the list goes on. And uh, you got to stop the pass. So uh, definitely with you on that one. All yeah, right, definitely. So, so good. So next one, this is a good one. So Saquon Barkley has said he's not going to sign his franchise tag tender, which makes him ineligible to play or participate in activities for the Giants. Now, this one's a little bit complicated, right? So Joe Shane puts an offer on the table at the bye week, right? Roughly around twelve and a half million. Supposedly, even after the season ended, they put another offer on the table for 13 million. Then the running back market just completely fell apart. I mean, the bottom fell out. You know, Miles Sanders, who had a phenomenal year with the Eagles last season, the Eagles said goodbye. We're not interested. We'll work with what we have, right? Ezekiel Elliott, mainstay for the Cowboys, uh, one of their own, drafted them. Same situation. Goodbye. So that market shifted, and Joe Shane said, Hey, I'm taking that offer off the table. We're going to franchise tag you play on the tag. It is what it is. Now I'm just curious your thoughts. There's a couple of uh, pieces in play here. Um, You know, mostly kind of like that personal aspect, right? So, you know, um, such Saquon Barkley have taken one of the two offers. Should Joe Shane have left one of the two offers on the table, 
right? Is there a meeting in the middle here between the two? Because at the end of the day, the running back position, whatever you might want to say about it, Saquon Barkley has been the face of this team for the last few seasons. He's played hurt. He suffered some devastating injuries last season. Uh, pro bowler, you know, almost comeback player of the year. Phenomenal. Giants don't make the playoffs without him, in my humble opinion. Where do you think this goes? Well, let's go back to the bye week when Saquon was offered that 12.5 million APY. At the time, he was kind of carrying the offense, if you remember. So I don't begrudge him or his agent for wanting a little bit more. Now, when the season ended, and of course, we saw a little bit of a shift there, um, you know, even the 13 million, this is where it gets a little sticky for me because I remember talking about it and writing about it, how, you know, Ezekiel Elliott, there was a lot of, you know, smoke being blown that he might get cut, which of course he did. The draft class was also touted as a very strong one at the running back position. So basically your supply was a lot greater than your demand, even with a talent like Saquon Barkley. And and he's talented. Let's, let's, you know, give the man credit. But you have to understand what the market is. And I question how well they really understood the market because, you know, like you said, Miles Sanders got what, six and a half million a year. And he's, he's not in Saquon Barkley's range, but, you know, what makes Barkley's camp think that Barkley's going to get Christian McCaffrey money? It just doesn't happen. It's just, we've seen a, a, a shift with the running back position over the last several years. We're just, the money's just not there. You know, and guys that have made the money, they don't finish out those contracts. So that was kind of uh, surprising that they didn't really have their finger on the pulse of it. Now, where I think this is going to go, I'll give you two scenarios here. Um, Where I hope it goes is that Saquon, you know, wakes up, takes a little bit more control of the situation and realizes that it's better to have a multi-year contract. With, with a couple, two, three years worth of guaranteed money, a lot more guaranteed money than the 10.1 million guaranteed money he's going to get when he signs that tag or if he signs that tag. That's what you hope for. But what I could see happening is he signs the tag if no deal is reached by July 17th, which is the deadline. And his agent is probably saying to him, okay, you know what? We're going to gamble again. You know, you had a good year last year. We're going to gamble on you again. How comfortable do you feel with gambling? Okay, you go out, you have another good year. Come 2024, the Giants probably are not going to be able to franchise you you again because they're going to potentially have Xavier McKinney coming up. Leonard Williams, if they don't get a deal done with him, he might be coming up. They might have some other guys that maybe they might want to put the franchise tag on if they don't get a deal done in time. So this is a little bit of a gamble here because obviously, you know, they could get deals done at some point, but you know maybe you're thinking if you're the agent, no way the Giants are going to tag you a second time in a row. But the drawback, obviously, is if Barkley gets hurt or if he doesn't match his production from a year ago, then you know that whole strategy goes down the toilet. Right, and a, a quick follow up, you know, if it does stay at a stalemate and Barkley does decide to come out and play. Do you think this has any ripple effect on the locker room? You know, obviously we've seen Dexter Lawrence take the same stance, a little bit of a different situation. Um, but do you think this has any resounding ripple effect on the locker room? Obviously the locker room and, and, and you know, the uh, consistency continuity that they built up behind the scenes was a big part of the 2022 season being successful. Just curious if you think this will have any effect if it stays. No, I don't think so. Dexter Lawrence, I think is going to get done if I had to take a guess on Dexter, I, I, he'll get done after the draft. I mean, yeah, I Shane do. said last week that, you know, hey, I've been kind of trying to have these draft meetings to get ready for that. So uh, Dexter's going to get done. I, I have no doubt about that. Um, with Barkley, I don't think it's going to cause a ripple effect. Now, th- this this is what I am a little concerned with because I don't recall who reported it. But I remember seeing somebody reported that Saquon felt a little deflated after, you know, not being able to reach a deal with the Giants. Right. All right. I get that. I can understand his perspective, but you've got to kind of toughen up a little bit here. It's business. It's nothing personal. We all think we're worth more than what we are. 
I know I do. I'm sure you think you are. Um, I've yet to meet a person who doesn't, who, who will sit there and say, oh, I'm, I'm worth what my employer is paying me. No, that, that doesn't exist. Right, right. So that being said, what do you do? You either sit there and you sulk because you're not getting what you think you're worth, or you go out there and you, you, you kick butt and you show that you are worth what you think you're worth. You know, you just work harder at it. And that's the approach I know I've taken. I know that's what you take. That's what Saquon's got to take. You know, you can't sit there and, and sulk and Oh, I didn't get that. I didn't get 15 million a year or 16 million a year. No, go out there and and just, you know, show it. And and people are going to sit there and say, well, he has shown it. He's been the offense last year. You know, he's he's been the face of the franchise. Yeah, I get all that. He's also had injury issues. All right. And not for nothing, but there was a period of time last year where, if I'm not mistaken, teams finally figured out how to shut him down. And he wasn't able to overcome that. Yep. So, you know take that into consideration and, and just, just come back and, and just keep working. And I know he's working. I know he's going to come into camp, you know, in tip top shape. I know he's going to come in determined, you know, last year we were talking about, you know, especially when he was crowing about, I'm going to have a great year. And we were like, okay, don't tell us, show us. Oh, yeah. show us. I, I, I have a, no doubt about that. And, and I think at some point he will get paid, whether that's with the giants, I don't know whether that's the amount he's looking for. I don't know, but I think at some point somebody will will give him, you know, a contract that he'll eventually settle for. Yeah, and you're right. You know, he did show us 1,300 yards rushing in the regular season, had a huge game versus the Minnesota Vikings in the wild card game. So we'll see. Complicated, but we'll see what happens. All right, time for the last question. This one might be a little bit of a hard one since we didn't get to the draft yet. But I just wanted to know your expectations for the 2023 Giants, obviously a lot of talk after the, after last season that, hey, a lot of one score games. It was kind of a lucky season. You know, they were they were the hunter, not the hunted. It's not going to it's not going to be the same next year. They're going to have a playoff type schedule. What do you think? 2023 New York Giants expectations? Well, I hope they win because I've said this before, um, it's much, much easier and more fun to cover a winning team yes, than it is a yes. losing team. I mean, gosh, these last few years <laughs> prior to last year, I mean, I felt like I was on, on a broken record with every, it was like, okay, how can I talk about the latest screw up now? You know, yeah. it was because it was the same thing, but um, look, expectations. I think it starts with the team's got to stay healthy, obviously. I mean, I have all the confidence in the world in the coaching staff. I think, you know, they finally hit it out of the park with this coaching staff. I like that there's going to be continuity with um, Kafka returning and Wink Martindale returning. So that was important, I think, because now you watch them, you know, in the, in the coming year, instead of, you know, playing a little bit slower because they're thinking things through, now they could play a lot quicker, I think. And, and be more effective. So that's, that was, you know, on their side, um, obviously getting some of these weapons that they have, you know, Darren Waller, I think is, if he stays healthy, going to do wonderful things for that Absolutely. offense. He's going to open up a lot of things on, in the flats and on the sideline for, for those smaller, quicker receivers to, you know, pick up the yards after the catch. People ask, why are they collecting so many of these small receivers? That's probably why. So to, you know, because they're yards after the catch specialists. Yep. So, you know, I think with a few more moves, you know, like I said, I'd like to see them beef up the cornerback and defensive back uh, field in general. Um, I'd like a center. I know I've been screaming about that for God knows how long, you know, Daniel Jones has had a different center every single year. He has been in the NFL. And I asked him about that when he spoke to the media last week. And I said, you know, how, how much of an effect does that have on you? And he said that it can be tough because you got to get on the same page with somebody film wise. So please get a center, Joe Shane, if you're watching this, get a center, please. Um, so yeah, there, there are other positions, you know, they, they need to fill in with the depth, you know, probably some more on the defensive line, you know, people will say, well, linebacker, I think edge rusher is a sneaky need. So with a few smart moves, I think, you know, this roster will be a, reinforced a lot more. And the expectations, you know, to think that they might um, hit their first double digit winning season since 2016. I don't think that's so far out of the question. I know it's going to be a harder schedule and whatnot, but, you know, and we have to see, of course, how the schedule falls because that's also important. But 
I think they, they're going to have all the elements in place to have another successful season. Awesome. So I just wanted to thank you for coming on Tommy's takes tonight. Um, you know, on the Giants Country Channel, you mean the world to me. You've been such a great mentor in my corner, um, such a hard worker, inspirational. I really appreciate everything you do. I know Giants fans around the globe appreciate everything you do. So thank you for coming on. Um, want to tell the audience what you have going on, where they can catch you? Yeah, make sure you're checking me out on the Locked on Giants podcast. I've got guests galore coming up this week, not to mention expanded draft coverage. Um, matter of fact, when this show airs, this particular episode of Tommy's Takes airing, I've got Bruce Feldman um, wow. airing over on my show, Locked on Giants podcast. Over on Giants country, uh, we've got some remaining draft prospect profiles. Brandon Olson and Nick Filato have been cranking those out. So we've got, I've got about 10 more I've got to do videos on and put those up. I think I'm going to do one more mock draft. I took a poll on Twitter and I think I'm going to do one more mock draft. I know a lot of people have asked about that. Um, And then make sure you're following me on social media at Patricia underscore trainer, T-R-A-I-N-A. Also on Instagram, I've started posting a lot more on Instagrams. That's P-A-T-T-I-T-R-A-I-N-A, Patty Traina. Um, I'll have video clips, um, info cards, all kinds of cool stuff, snippets of uh, my Locked On uh, podcast shows. Uh, so yeah, just going to try and give you as much content as I can in the coming weeks. And we're excited over on Giants Country because we are going to hopefully knock this out of the park with this draft coverage. Yeah, make sure please go subscribe to Locked On Giants. Subscribe to Tommy's Takes. You can check me out on Twitter, Tommy G105. Giants Country is the team. That's it for tonight. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in to Tommy's Takes. See you soon. Peace.